today. Uh, we have this LinkedIn.org. And I'm going to talk uh, today about the least two of LinkedIn, which all goes away out within a month. I don't know exactly when, but probably within a month, maybe three weeks. Uh, it's probably a little sooner if I weren't here, but uh, that's how that goes. Uh, we thought it would be a little sooner than that, and it wouldn't be a conflict, but that's not how it worked out. So. I have more material here than I can present in an hour. So let me ask a few questions to get started. Or more than 50 minutes. How many people here have uh, know what Linux HA is or looked at the website or something like that? How many people here have used it or have installed it uh, in some way for so maybe a tenth of the people here looks like they've used it and uh thirds or maybe a half of have uh spent some time with it. A little, so in that case, I'm, I'm going to give more background and less detail uh, because a lot of people here have not spent much time with it. So I can talk a little about what HA clustering is, what you can do with HA, uh, you know, what you can't do as well, about the Linux HA project, how people use it, what kind of customers we have, a few of them, and then talk about both what release two, release one, which the current release can do, and release two, which is the one that will be out very soon, will do. And uh, um, actually, it says something that we talked about future for this, but I never put that slide in. And I'm out of time anyway, so I'll be out of time anyway. So, high quality clustering is the idea of putting together a group of computers into a cluster, which basically means a number of machines acting as one, so that they can provide a service continually, or more or less continually. Uh, even when one system component fails, like a whole machine fails, and this fails, whatever. When one machine goes down, the others take over its work. Uh, this involves things like IP address takeover, things like that. Um, and it's not primarily designed, it's kind of clustering, so it's not primarily designed for high performance. Although you can get performance improvements out of it, that's not its primary purpose. One thing I want to say, there is no such thing as 100% availability, it does not exist. People who talk about, I want 100% availability, what they really say is, I want to spend an infinite amount of money and effort and time to get something less than 100% availability. Um, because, you know, it's an exponential curve. The law of diminishing returns applies here. The more you spend, the more you have to spend to get the next improvement. It's, uh, it's like uh, calculus. You know, you can cut the distance in half each time. Um, maybe, maybe it would be like the example where the, where the guy, the, the, Mathematician and the engineer, uh, since the mathematician has the other couch, he said you can go across this pretty girl at the other end, but you only cut the half distance and half each time. He says, huh, I'm going to do that. He said the engineer down on the same couch at the other end, he immediately starts halving the distance. And, 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 and he asked him, what are you doing that for? The mathematician said, what are you doing that for? You can never get there. He says, but soon I'll be close enough for all practical purposes. <laughs> so you can get HA when you're close enough for all practical purposes, but you really can't get 100%. Just like the mathematical uh, example here. Uh, but you can be close enough that you know you keep your job. That's the main thing. Um, it can make your outages very short. It's designed really to recover from single failures, not multiple failures, although it often does recover from multiple failures. It's a lot like a magician's trick. And, and, and like magician tricks, sometimes you look at it and say, wow, how did he do that? Sometimes you look at it and say, that's a cheap trick. That's not so good. And the, the thing is true about HA. Sometimes you'll think it's wonderful, magic. And other times you think that gets be better. But but HA is designed to improve your availability. It is one of the few things you can do for a relatively modest investment, which will cut your downtime by 90%. What that says is you're still left with 10%. So it adds a nine to your availability, that way of looking at it. And one thing to remember though. Of course, as you try to improve it more and more and more, it gets more and more and more complex, and eventually your complexity becomes your enemy. And it becomes so complex you can no longer maintain it. Uh, so one of the things we try to keep in mind as we design things is complexity is the enemy of reliability. Um, we really work to engineer out single points of failure. A single point of failure is a component whose failure will cause the whole system to stop delivering service. And good HA design will eliminate single points of failure. That's sort of obvious. <laughs> but how does HA work? You, if, you're gonna, if you have a single point of failure, the obvious thing is to provide a redundant component of some kind 
that does the same thing you can then use to do what the failed component used to do when it worked. So it's, uh, we managed the redundancy to improve availability. The simple way to understand this is sort of like you have a, an init process that runs over the whole cluster. And I say super cluster, uh, super cluster wide init on steroids. That's kind of the way to think of it. If you thought of a NIT with respawn as, oh, that restarts my Getty and that works really well, of course, if you try to respawn the network, you'll discover that respawning network doesn't work too good. Um, but this is analogous to saying you have a respawn on your services that if they die or they stop working, oh, they just get restarted. That's what really HA does. And it can, uh, you can do it on impairment of nodes, on death of nodes, on loss of productivity to the outside world. For services that aren't working. Now I know this has never happened to you guys, but you know sometimes databases like they're running, but they aren't doing anything. <laughs> Apache's running, but it's mainly you can tell it's mainly consuming memory. Um, well, the idea is that in an HA system you want to also detect those as well as simple depth of, of, of nodes as well. So. So you have a lot of redundant things you have to then manage. One of the things, redundant communications, and one of the most important things is your nodes in the cluster can't communicate with each other, then they cannot make any decision about what to do. They can't talk to each other. All else is, it, it's kind of hopeless. So the first thing you usually go after is redundant communication because without redundant communication, you can't manage the rest of your redundancies. So external communication is also typically essential to the, to the provision of service as well. And often, communication to the outside world is accomplished more through routing tricks, BGP or uh, OSPF routing, to, to get that done. And for that piece, it's, uh, it, you know, it's helpful to have an expert in that around to manage those things. So I'm going to talk less about that and more about the other aspects. You also need redundant access to your data. And you can do that either for replication or for sharing or for making it somebody else's problem. Um, really, if you're ready to hitchhike your guide to the galaxy, it's like covering it with a somebody else's problem field. It's still there, but no one can. Uh, um, so you can have replicated access. That is to say, you have data over here, you make a copy of it over there. You can have shared data where two machines share the same piece of data, neither one can access it. Or you can do back end storage of some kind where somebody else has to manage the availability of that service, but you can't, or don't, or don't want to, or whatever and they manage their availability in their own way, uh, making it not your problem. Now, one of the questions I ask is, how many people in the audience want low availability? <laughs> okay, thank you. There is one in the audience. This is the first time I've had two, though. Congratulations, guys. This is a, this is a first. Now, I'll ask, ask the next question, too. How many of you have all the availability you want? This is the majority hat. Usually the same, come on guys, raise your hands. The two of you need to raise your hands again. It's always the same guys, thank you. Um, so the question to ask yourself, the interesting, useful question is, why are so few systems high availability? If everybody wants more and everybody doesn't have it, why not? I'm a sales guy. Um, but actually, who writes it up? But the, there's two answers to this for the most part. One is cost, and the other is complexity. Now, with open source software, what's the cost? Free. The hardware, though, with commodity hardware like uh, IBM Tech Series machines, the cost. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm choosing as opposed to Z Series or P Series. Commodity hardware has costs which are very important. Whatever it is, you can buy HP if you really want. But you can buy uh, whoever's hardware you want. But the point is that, that I have an HA file server in my house. Which, if you build it for white box parts, and you set, oh, I built for um, 800 euros, an HA file server with no single points of failure. The cost can be eliminated here. The cost can be taken care of here in a way that people, most people, do not appreciate or understand. However, the second item here, you cannot give away complexity. Complexity is like latency in networks. You can always solve the bandwidth problem by throwing more money at it. Solving latency. How many people here have actually solved latency problems in networks? It's much harder. Complexity is like latency. It's very hard to get rid of. And in fact, I mentioned earlier that complexity is the enemy of reliability. And so that once you solve the cost problem, pretty soon you're stuck with, well, the real reason I don't want to do this is because it makes my head hurt. 
But we try and manage that as well, and I think we do a pretty good job of it. This is a, like a general open source chart about HA, about open source in general, but about HA in particular. Traditionally, people have charged for HA systems kind of in the hundred thousand dollars to a million dollar range to have an HA system, depending on how it goes. Nobody sold you an HA file server for eight hundred euros. I guarantee you that. <laughs> um, but so if you take these costs and lower them down and down and down, what does that do to the volume? It increases it. And as a person who gets developers out of my users, what does that mean? I get more developers. And, and this is in fact what's been happening. As we've decreased the cost, the number of people using it has gone up significantly. We have people using it for things like, we have high availability bad readers out there, man. Now it turns out there's a really good reason for that. But if they wouldn't have spent a quarter million dollars to make their bad readers high availability. Although maybe in this particular application they should have, but they wouldn't have. Um, we have, you know, what I was, I got locked out of, uh, they have these storage unit things in the U.S. You go and rent storage somewhere. And I tried to get out. I punched my number to get out. It wouldn't let me out. I punched to get it. It wouldn't let me out. And I, and, I, and I finally found out why is that when this machine had crashed, it was taking the next 10 minutes to reboot. And I was stuck. It could not get out. Now, I, I, I know where I want to sell an HA system cheap to these guys. And I don't really, you know, it's like, what, did they do something wrong? Did they call the police? You know, I, you don't know what's wrong. They just won't let you out. Um, so, a little about the Linux HA project, though. But the point, I guess, one, one more thing here about this is developers go up here too. And the, the whole thing about open source software is it works once you reach a critical mass and the project becomes self-sustaining. I, I hate to draw the analogy between a, a nuclear explosion and, and, and uh, open source software, but it's very similar. You have to reach critical mass so that the reaction becomes self-sustaining. So what I'm after here in my project, why I've gone after the low end stuff, is because the volume goes up very rapidly as the costs go down. Linux HA is the oldest high availability project, not as old as me, uh, but it's old, uh, with the largest associated community. We have uh, thousands of people, uh, we have about 1,000, 1,500 people on the mailing list at the moment. We probably have around 10,000 installed clusters in the, in, in the world. Day. The core piece of the Linux HA software is called Heartbeat, although there's a lot more than that. It's one of those things, what's your name? Something can change the name. Uh, it's been in production since about 1999, and, and uh, it runs on, the addition it's called Linux HA, it also runs on 3BSD Solaris, and I think it's run on OpenBSD in the past, but I'm not sure what the current status on that is. I'd like for them to finish that floor if somebody would do that. Uh, Linux HA is shipped with every li li uh, major Linux distribution, uh, Debian, Gen2, uh, except one, yeah, except one. Uh, SUSE uh, um, and so on, all except for the Red Hat distribution. They have their own solution for that. Um, we're hoping to change that in the future and we think that might happen. But a lot of people use it, that's the point. Uh, people use it for all kinds of things. These are for load, load balancers, web servers, database servers. Uh, I mentioned uh, badge readers. Uh, custom applications like badge readers, firewalls, retail point of sale solutions, one of our big things IBM sells this with uh, a solution that, uh, it, how many people here from Germany? You know Karstads, right? Karstads run Linux HA on their, in, in the back office of all of their uh, uh, retail, all, all the retail uh, stores, as it's sort of called. And um, authentication, file servers, proxy servers, medical limits, all kinds of things people use it for. About the only thing I know of that, that, that no one's used it for so far that's come up is SAP. Um, SAP has an interesting architecture that is a little more <laughs> and some of the people that use this uh, imagine using the medical imaging uh, carpet I mentioned Bavarian radio station Munich I covered the 2002 Olympics I like that story because guys sent me an email and he said you know we were there and, the, and then my system administrator made a mistake and he crashed the machine now I know you guys the system administrators they don't make mistakes like this guy's did uh, but he made a mistake during the Olympic coverage, and he just fell over the other machine. He said, and it, and it worked. It worked. <laughs> I always like this. I always like this it works when it needs to, right? Um, Steve Saving Bank in Munich used it for various things at Weather Channel, Sony. Autostrada has uh, 230 clusters all over Italy. I think it's like a Tolkien's application. I'm not really sure what that application is. Uh, 
the power grid in New England, uh, not New York, where, where they had the power outage. Uh, in New England, they meant, I did notice, I have to tell you, the day I heard about the power outage on the East Coast, I went to go check their website, see if these guys were still up. And they were. Fine, you're a lot unrelated to the DJ law. But I could always play credit. <laughs> um, let me take at least one. I described it. Have you, how many people have seen this? Arch, the, the, the thing about arch, architects designing a swing. Have you ever seen that cartoon? Yeah. It shows them it getting infinitely more complex and all the customer wanted was a tire swing. <laughs> well, let's say take release one. It's like a tire swing. You can get on it and you can just get your HA and swing to your heart's content as long as what you want. It was a tire swing. And that's why SAP did something a little more than a tire swing. One of these three layer swings or something like that. If you saw those pictures. Um, so, but it does lots of things. It does, you know, no, uh, it notices when nodes fail and fail over some services. It can do, use various communication methods. And it can also detect uh, loss of connectivity to the outside world. You can detect loss of SAN connectivity. You can set it up as active, 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 passive. A lot of different things. Most people actually want, and most deployments are two-node clusters because people understand two-node clusters. It's like, there's only two possibilities. Either they're both up or only one's up. Take the chances, you know? Or none of them. In which case, you know, you also know what to do there, too, right? And so, you, you know, either everything's running on one machine, or you have things running on both machines, potentially, or if you have an active passive, you have, you know, everything running on one machine, or everything running on one machine. Um, so you, the choices are even simpler. But people like those things because complexity is indeed the enemy of reliability. So even though release two does a lot more things, a lot of people are going to use it for two dollar clusters because they know how they work. And and uh, occasionally you find that the, the people who design these systems are not as smart as the people who manage them, and then you run into problems. But if you stick with the lowest common denominator, it'll work for you. You know, I mean that's that's not related to Linux and chain, That's just related to good advice, right? Um, so it has some uh, command, some sort of simple mail administration <laughs> tools and. And if you want to monitor resources like whether your web server is working or not with release one, you have to use something like Mod or Modit or one of those tools to monitor that, and it can cause a failure to trigger Linux HA. That's how, and it can, but you can do SNMP and some other things with it. But it's kind of limited compared to what some people want. The most commonly requested thing is this getting rid of the need for an external tool to monitor resources like your database server to see if it's really working. Um, so, but release two does that and a lot more things. It does have built-in release resource monitoring, which I put first because that is the most commonly requested feature. So that you don't have to write another tool and, 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 and configure two tools. The average person, by the way, gets release one up in about a half day. We've seen people who don't know anything about HA. It takes them a half day to go get the software, download it, uh, install it on the machine, and read the manuals. Well, if they read the manuals. <laughs> um, and uh, or fuss around with it and get it working without reading the documentation, which appears to be the paradigm that most people use. Um, but on the other hand, I'm not going to get people to read the manual, so we've actually spent a lot of effort uh, putting messages in that says, you know, this isn't going to work because, and maybe you should read the manual in the messages, uh, because Unix administrators read the, read the system logs. Windows administrators assume there's nothing meaningful in the system logs and they never read them. <laughs> and, you know, I can't blame them. I never saw anything meaningful in Windows system log either. <laughs> um, but we support much larger clusters up to, well, we've been currently testing with about eight nodes. I kind of don't know what the limit is. It's probably the limit is, you know, of, of how complex you want to set up your, your configuration and, and so on. We have a lot more sophisticated, a lot more sophisticated dependency model. Uh, where you can say, this resource depends on that one, but they don't have to run on the same machine. That's the kind of things you need to do for SAP. Uh, SAP does not, for example, if, if, if it's connecting up with the network to another component, and it goes down, you have to restart both components, and even though they're running on different machines. And that's the kind of thing you can't do with release one. Um, it has a lot richer set of constraint support and so on. Notice I said it, complexity is the enemy of reliability. Does that sound more complex? I'm afraid it does. We are still just as concerned as we ever were about it, so we're adding as little complexity as we can, but you, you don't get something for nothing. And the, the resource configuration uh, stuff is all XML based, which simplifies writing GUIs and so on and forth, and other uh, auxiliary tools because it's a standard kind of format, like it or not. 
Um, we are adding some of these things here are things that are not currently yet in CBS, but these are things we're in the process of working on that will occur probably by June. Um, and the things like a configuration monitoring GUI, that will happen sooner than that. We're going to work with GFS, which is the next talk about so we can integrate and work together with GFS. Uh, Multi-state master slave resource re resources. There are some kinds of resources. Most resources is like I just stop or it started. There are some kinds of resources that are that are more complex than that. They're stop, they're in slave mode, or they're in master mode. So we have, we're going to be handling some others like that. Most other HA systems handle that by a combination of weird kludges that you have to kind of know the, how to make it work. We're trying to handle it a little more directly here. Uh, to start with, it's not going to have like here sand motor like the new one does, unfortunately. Uh, there's something that's just really simple in, in two node clusters that we have to think about how to do it right in release two that we haven't uh, scoped that out at this point. So release two credits, I want to give credit, special credit to Andrew Beekoff, who wrote the, by far the most complex piece of release two this. Uh, CRM and CIB, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, some other people who uh, work for NCSA in the U.S. and for IBM in China. Uh, uh, Lars Borowski, if you know him, he was part uh, of the architecture, and he's been a PhD, 40 year boss, for uh, Andrew Beekoff. And, he, and, and I've done various things, uh, mostly as little as I can. That's, that's the whole paradigm of open source software. The idea is you get a project together and you get other people to do it. <laughs> The release one architecture has various processes and so on. Basically, everything here talks to a master control process, and the processes that actually talk to the network are separate. And there are there are you know security and simplicity reasons why we do that. You can have a client or uh, APIs and so on here. And uh, release two has more processes and so on than that. In this process, most of what was on the other chart is in this heartbeat communication and connectivity layer. Um, but I'm going to talk a little more about release two architecture because it's, I think, far more interesting. There's a cluster resource manager that is basically the policy, um, is in charge of policy and has two pieces of uh, PE policy engine and TE transition engine, which are part of it, which I didn't show, as separate parts. This is like all the boxes I can fit on the screen. Um, it has a, a membership layer, which does consensus membership, which has a lot of nice guarantees for consensus. Um, fully, fully connected consensus membership. A local resource manager, which basically does the job of starting this. It's like, it's, it's like a dumb init. It starts and stops things for uh, locally for the CRM. Uh, the cluster information base, which is a, a, a set of data about the configuration, which is then kept consistent. This doesn't say database, because that would be like too sophisticated. We're not that sophisticated. It's much simpler than that. Stone stands for shoot. The other node in the head. How many people have trouble remembering that acronym? Shoot the other node in the head. Um, so it's basically a demon that's designed to terminate machines that have left the cluster without permission. So if, you know, it's not like leaving the high school room without a note, you go to the bathroom without having a note. You leave our room, we shoot you. Um, so these are the basic components that go into the community. Heartbeat is now. Its primary pur purpose, the old heartbeat code, is this communication layer. Um, it does um, uh, reliable multicast and things like that. It, it's always done that. It's not changed, really. And these, all the green arrows there are clients of heartbeat. All the blue arrows are uh, client server. We have a lot of client server type relationships here, and that's what most of the arrows are. And uh, the green ones just go into heartbeat, and the blue ones go elsewhere. You tell the, see, I thought that the green code was the most important. That's what I wrote. Can, can, you, can you tell something about this consensus cluster membership? That sounds fascinating. Uh, the consensus cluster membership guarantees that, that everyone who's in the member... The truth about communications is that it breaks, right? Yeah. And, and as a result, a cluster you'd like to think of as one thing becomes more than one thing because you get divisions in the communication. That can happen. I know you've never had it happen where you had a switch port go out, uh, but it does happen. And, and, and so you can imagine it get, maybe get divided in half depending on how you have your switches and stuff set up and the kind of bugs you have. And maybe you screwed up your firewall rules. I don't, you, know, you guys don't do that either, <laughs> but my customers do. Um, so, so if you become our customer, then you can screw it up too. So, 
So the idea is maybe your communication only four nodes here can communicate with themselves and four nodes here can communicate with themselves. But what that guarantees is that everyone is in that four node. They all have agreement that they're all in the membership and that they can all communicate bidirectionally with each other. So it, it's a sort of transitive closure on the connectivity matrix uh, <laughs> combined with uh, selecting a click or a collection of those machines that can do that. And if you think about that, that's probably an empty complete, that's an empty complete problem. Therefore, we use output heuristics, uh, since we don't have a solved P versus NP. So those of you who don't know what P versus NP is, it's, it's, it's a major, major computer science problem. It's, it would make you famous, infinitely famous for generations if you were to solve that problem. Um, so, uh, so basically what we do is we have a heuristic that computes a set of machines that can communicate with each other, and a guarantee is that all of them in there all agree that they're members. And so there's some guarantees about, the, about, about who can communicate with whom and who all is in the membership and that everyone that is in that membership agrees that they're in that membership. And, and when you have, you ever try to get a bunch of people to agree? This is like that, except that they're stupider than people. <laughs> but not as often. Um, so, so it's, 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 a, it, it's actually a proof, there are a lot of results, if you haven't looked at the theoretical results for clusters, there's hardly anything you can prove you can do. In fact, you can prove you can't do most things uh, in, in a perfect way, in an optimal way. Um, however, it's like the other thing, you, you, you do a good enough job for all practical purposes, and that's what we do here. <coughs> Does that help with that, with that question? Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> um, so we have what we call resource objects. Instead of just resources, they're kind of a more abstract resource object thing. But no, it's not in C++. It's still in C. We wanted it to be reliable. <laughs> um, and actually, that's honestly, our, well, the C++ versus C was about memory allocation. One of the goals of an HA system is, think of it this way, we want to run without stop for 100 years. How many bytes of memory leak do you get then? Zero. How many, have, have people seen any C++ program where you run for a year with zero bytes of memory leak? Not very many. And it's not that you can't, it's just that you use all these other libraries that you do and, and it's easy to use them and it's hard not to use them and they aren't always as good a quality as your code. So we made the choice to use C instead of C++. Largely for the memory degrees, honestly. Um, you can have primitive resources, which is something like a web server, a file server. We have three different flavors of resources. Um, basically, one of the things you can do is we have an init script for your service. You can tell us, oh, that's a resource and we just know how to deal with it by itself. We won't know how to monitor it, we'll know how to do most things with it. You can do heartbeat style, which is release one style, or these open cluster framework style ones. They're all pretty similar to each other, but there are slightly variations on them. And basically that means like starting and stopping a service, starting and stopping an IP address, something simple like that. Or you can have something which is called a resource incarnation, like I want to have um, 10 copies of this running. I want to have, for example, if you're using GFS and global file system, you want to have a copy of the mount on every machine, right? Whatever you have mounted on every machine. Uh, resource groups and I'm going to talk about co-location and linear ordering constraints, but basically it amounts to basically a clone of the kind of things you can do in release one. I'll just say that, and we'll get to what co-location and linear ordering constraints are in a minute. Um, Multi-state resources, which I talked a little bit about, the master slave resources, uh, they're really useful for replication. Because, you know, if you, DRBD is a, is, a, is a system that replicates data from one machine to another. It basically acts as a block device which replicates the data over the land at the same time. And you can either be running the RBD or not, and if you're running it, it can either be in master mode or in slave mode. So that's three states, not just two. And most HA software deals with that badly. And since we think the RBD is really important, we try to do a little better job of that. I mean, it's not that they don't do it, it's not that it doesn't work, it's just that that isn't obvious. And, and, and not obvious, but the most probable cause of an HA system to fail that's been properly designed, administered, and set up is human error. The most probable cause of human error is misunderstanding what the software is going to do. And that means the more your, your mental model that the software has matches the mental model of the human being, the more likely they are to do the right thing. 
Now, what I, what I did is just the late to get these calls at 2 in the morning. Nothing ever happened during the day. <laughs> Worse yet, I actually, the worst ones were, I came in in the morning and said, well, this hasn't worked since 2 in the morning and I didn't call you, and now everyone's standing over, breathing over my neck over something that I could have gotten up at 2, fixed, and gone back to sleep, and then told my boss I'm going to come in late today. But now instead, I, I, I came in on time and everyone's breathing down my neck. I'd rather get woke up at 2 in the morning. <laughs> um, basic dependency is the kind of things you can do <coughs> in release 2. You can have ordering dependencies. That is to say, this service has to start before that service. Uh, you can also have co-location dependencies. By co-location, I mean must run on the same machine as this other machine. For example, if you have an Apache web server, it's probably a good idea to co-locate it with the IP address that the web server is trying to serve. <laughs> if you don't, you'll be disappointed. <laughs> And someone on the mailing list will be happy to straighten you out. Um, so you can either start before or start after, and must be co-located with. And, and this one is actually in here for SAP. Cannot be co-located with. There's some things in SAP that have to be run on a different machine for this other piece, or it doesn't work. It's not the SSAP, but SAP comes to mind. That was so. You can, instead of having this linear list where you have a dependency A runs before B, runs before C, runs before D, and they're all on the same machine, this is more of a directed asymptotic graph. It it's, uh, allows more, more, uh, more flexibility in how you set it up and more ways to screw it up. So uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people have plugged in and wanted to use resource groups. It works, it's there, it's simple, and it's harder to screw up. I, I, I love things that I cannot screw up. You can also have mandatory constraints, and now we're getting the sort of preferential constraints. A mandatory constraint, you can tell this resource it has to run on one of these machines. Like, it would be good to run on a machine that has a fiber channel attachment to the disk that you want to have. Um, and maybe every machine doesn't have that. Um, like in the case of the RBD, it's two-way mirroring, so you have to run on this machine or on that machine. So it better run on one of those two. Um, and the default, by the way, is that a given resource can run nowhere. So if you forget to tell it, it won't be able to run anywhere. Uh, you can also have preferential constraints that say, well, I would really rather it didn't run on the same machine as this. But if it has no choice, for example, like all the other machines are down, it will run it somewhere else. Basically, it tries to satisfy the mandatory constraints first and the preferential constraints second. Um, and you can. You can provide weightings kind of thing that says, well, I prefer for this to be run on this machine, but I prefer even more for it not to be run on this machine kind of thing, you know? And it tries to uh, it deals with those kind of things in the appropriate fashion. And, and this is more complex. This is the kind of thing you, you use when you need to use it. A lot of people, as I said, are very, very happy with the tire swing approach. A lot of release two stuff is trying to satisfy the remaining needs. The point about this is when you, this is the kind of thing that makes a difference between a system which works pretty well and a lot of people are really happy with, the one that will really compete with any commercial HA system out there. And um, that's where we're at really with release two, is it, it is comparable to pretty much any commercial HA system out there. Um, and, and, and that's important. Not because everybody cares about that, but because people like to run the same software everywhere. And if we can't solve a com all of a company's problems, they're going to want to get a solution that can and produce that same solution everywhere. So it cuts us out of all the places that where we can just do the simple thing. Because they don't want to learn two cluster systems. Um, oh, this is useful for managing. What are you supposed to admit that's useful? Oh, managing these things. There, that's what I did. Um, resource incarnations, that's the example of where you can have more than one of something running. And if that's useful for managing low balancing clusters, that's just like it says here, right? Uh, <laughs> Load balancing clusters, for example, where you want to have a load balancer up front, which is run by run on one of two machines, and there's a bunch of web servers behind it, and then behind that a database server. Well, all these different web servers, you want to run 100 copies, maybe, or spread across the machine. So you give it uh, a load balancing cluster, we want any of them to be slave servers. Um, it's useful for dealing with cluster file systems, where you can actually run the same file system on one one machine simultaneously and not crash the data. It's useful for certain kinds of IP alias techniques uh, called cluster IP aliases, where uh, more than one machine responds 
correctly to the same IP address. You have to set up the car stuff right, but you could, that's, that's something you can deal with. Um, resource groups I mentioned before, they're kind of a shorthand for providing ordering and co-location dependencies all at once as long as you don't care that the club don't mind starting them all one after the other in a linear sequence. Um, as I mentioned here before, each resource object in the group is basically declared to have a linear start after order relationship and each resource in the group is declared to have co-location dependencies on the previous ones ahead of it, which basically means they all run on the same machine and they all run in order you have them listed. That's much simpler to describe, isn't it? Um, this is an easy way of converting release one relief resource groups into release two, and honestly, what a lot of people are going to need most of the time for most of the things they do, and it has the advantage of it does what you want. In all probability, it does what you want. Um, master slave resources, and I mentioned I've talked about this a couple of times, but the main thing to note is it's ideal for replication resources, where you're replicating data from this machine to this machine. Either that it's running the replicator, or it's running in master mode, or it's running slave mode. That's some kinds of replication can actually be bidirectional replication. <coughs> that's not an issue here, that's another kind of resource, but not everyone can. Some want to know which is the master, which is the slave. Um, you can have associate arbitrary, now we're getting into a little more, more esoteric, honestly. Uh, nodes can have arbitrary attributes associated with them. For example, you can say, uh, these nodes um, have a fiber channel connection. You know, you know, you say FC equals yes, right? For example, as you're having, and, and then you can set color resource. This resource must run on a node that has FC equals yes. And then, and, and so that's a way of specifying then the, the attributes or properties of the resource, and then having the resources run on the ones that have those properties, as opposed to just an extended, you know, a specific list of them. And that's often handier. Or you can say, for example, they have uh, running so release software release greater than 4.3 or whatever. Um, as it says, they, the types are integer, string, and version. Versions, of course, being strings that compare like integers but not, right? 1.2.3 is greater than 1.2.2 uh, and less than 1.3, you know, those kind of things. The, uh, the weird things that people do in version. And you can do the usual you know, kind of comparison operators. And you can also say, I want to run on one that has, has defined, does that have to be defined to be something, or not defined. Or, I want to run on, I want to run on those that's co-located with those other resources, not co-located. And these are preferential constraints, so you can say that this, you get a weighting out of this, which then says that, I would really like it if you would run this, but if you can't, that's alright too. So, when you get into larger clusters, you get into these kinds of, in more complex environments, you get into things, which you have to want to spend the time to test what you're doing here. You have to, you have to have a good reason to do these, in my view. Now, not that there aren't good reasons to do it, but the majority of cases don't need this. 90% of the uh, HA cases in the world don't need this because the more complex you get in here, the less likely you are to get it right. Human beings are like that. I've noticed that about me, anyway. So you can go on and do other kinds of constraints. Each constraint is associated with a particular resource and, and it's caught, evaluated for each node it might run on. And, and, it's, and then if, if the thing turns out to be true, then the weighting that's the given there is applied. And the weighting basically can be a positive or negative integer, and the weightings of all the things that apply are added up, and, and it then tries to figure out roughly where you want it to run. There's no attempt here to optimize the cluster installation automatically. That's really hard. It's an you know, <coughs> integer linear programming problem that we probably would need most of the resources to cluster to possibly compute where we ought to be running the resources. And that was something we decided that probably wasn't good for release 2.0.0. Tongue in cheek, guys. Uh, it may not be good ever because it's the kind of thing you want. One of the things you want here in reliable systems is you want to know what it's going to do when you cause a failure because you want to be pretty confident that you've tested that situation. Because a system which, an HA system which isn't work, isn't tested, isn't HA. It may work. You may get lucky. Probably won't all the time. So those are the kind of things you do. I want to talk a little about security here, which is a, a, an aside one of my hobby horses to talk about with regard to clustering. And a cluster is a computer whose backplane is the internet. How many people find that frightening? 
Good. This is good. Um, you may think you have a secure cluster network. There are two kinds. You're probably mistaken now. You will be mistaken later. Okay? And where is this? Okay. Okay. And the reason why that's difficult is security is not often well understood by admins. And the person who sets it up may have done just fine when they set it up, but they turned it over to somebody else and went on to do bigger and better things, got promoted, left the company, formed their own company, whatever. And the people left behind doing it, they don't understand it as well. And then you have your hardware installers to go in the back room and plug cables together. And maybe they cross-connected two networks which didn't, shouldn't have been. Maybe somebody set up a route on one of the Windows machines. You had Trojan on the Windows machine set up a route. <laughs> um, it's easy to breach accidentally. Users bypass it deliberately. Hardware installers don't fully understand it, and that's very, very, that's normal. Most security traces do, in fact, come from trusted staff, and staff turnover is a big issue. I mentioned that you know the person who installed it understands it, and that's somebody else is maintaining it. The combination of viruses and peer-to-peer -peer technologies are frightening. Uh, you know, instead of having one that, that 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 sends out spam, how about one that opens, you know, you know, you know, a Trojan that comes and makes all the Windows machines in your company set up spam? How about one instead that opens up our outgoing firewall hole, holes in your firewall? So that uh, that's certainly going to happen. The question is when. So, so security is a very big concern. And remember, the reason why it's a big concern for clusters is clusters, their back plane is really the internet. Now, you can argue it's a secure network, but I already made reasons why I, I have to click that suspect. Now, honestly, I like crossover cables. They're reasonably secure. All else is suspect. Um, good HA software should be assigned, should be designed to assume insecure networks. Good HA administrators will assume that the software doesn't work, and they'll put it on what they think to be secure networks. So each of you needs to mutually distrust the other to have a good installation. <laughs> but if you look at clustering software, the vast majority of it kind of assumes, well, you know, performance is really important, and, you know, you're going to have a secure network. I know you are, really, truly. And so this is something to be cautious of. A lot of software does not do that in what I would consider a reasonable way. So, actually I got through the whole talk. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have had that extra little caffeine by before it came in. <laughs> um, so, this is, this is kind of the view of what we kind of try to do in release two. People use this for all, all kinds of so solutions. I really truly do have an HA file server in my house and man, my MP3s play all the time. <laughs> so I have my priorities ready. Um, and, and, and that's actually how I tested it one day when my wife was out of the house. This is important, my wife was out of the house. <laughs> and, and so I started playing music on this machine, and then I went over to this other machine and started playing music. And this, was a, this one was using this client, and this one was using this other client, this one was NFS, and this was SMB. And it had four or five different songs. You know, you cannot get these songs synchronized. <laughs> and so it kind of sounds a little odd. And then, you know, I failed the machine back and forth, and I was just happy and just really glad my wife was. Um, so what I'm trying to say is this technology, indeed, can be affordable. Don't misunderstand that you don't have an application for this that you didn't think you had. Okay? Um, you really can make the, these things work, particularly with technologies like this for file system replication and DRBD. Um, that's, the, that's a key for what makes it inexpensive. Um, I mean, I replicate from one IDE drive to another IDE drive. I don't have a... Now, on the other hand, I gotta, you know, by all means, when the IBM salesman comes to you and says, buy higher channel, well, you know, buy, buy everything the IBM salesman tells you to buy. <laughs> <laughs> but, because uh, that's, because I, cause that's, you know, what keeps me employed. When they make money, I, I keep my job. So I'm happy about that. Uh, questions? Yes? Oh, here. Uh, you want to talk about uh, single points of failure and some kind of you know, digital architecture. Yes. Uh, what about the connection the question, the question is about the connection between the two nodes of the cluster and how they relate to single points of failure. Yeah, because Yes. 
Right. So he's asking here about setting up something, and he mentioned that, if I understand it correctly, that you didn't feel like you set it up correctly. The point of the, the point of the thing is, you do want, in fact, to have no single point of failure. Actually, in the case of DRBD, if you'd had a second with, with heartbeat, certainly it would have known the two sides were back up. And you can heartbeat over as many different interfaces as you want. You know, your paranoia is only limited by your budget <laughs> and the complexity. But two is a minimum recommendation for heartbeat pass. You heard me mention earlier on, even though I was probably talking too fast, uh, that it was very, very important that intercluster communication be replicated because if it's not, then you get the result you got because the two sides don't know what's going on. Any of them thinks it does, and they don't. So that's a bad thing. And that's also another reason why people use phones as well in this environment. Further questions? Oh, sorry. I shouldn't walk in front of that light. I can't see. Yeah, go ahead. Right. He's asking what kind of heartbeats are currently available on Linux HA. And you can heartbeat over uh, UDP multicast, UDP uh, unicast, UDP broadcast, uh, serial. Uh, you can set up funny kinds of heartbeats called ping heartbeats, where it appears that your router is a cluster member. Uh, but the normal ones are UDP multicast, UDP unicast, UDP broadcast, and serial. Will there be uh, the, 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 all the communication in release two is the same as the communication in release one. Uh, we have a we actually have a ping mechanism that will come that we do for disk drives in release one. Eventually, that will get adapted to release two after we figure out how to do it right. It's not going to be something that's going to happen right away because honestly, we have a lot of things to do and and uh, you know we need to think about. We have a really nice thing at least one that works very well. We need to figure out how to adapt it to release two and it's much more complex than possible. Okay. Further questions before the rest of the guys leave here. Over here, uh, the guy on the end. You. Yeah. Yeah, you. You're right about testing. You could have built one of these things. Tell your management, don't put it in production until you've tested it. You can test the walking up and yanking the power cord there. That's one problem. Yank the power cord there. So what he said was, he just reiterated what I said is, if, if you don't test it, it, it isn't it isn't HA. Yeah. I mean, that's the short answer. Uh, a quick question about the running as much or running as slave processes. Could you use a new DRBD to do notes? Yeah. 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 DRBD slave fields. Could you have some other slaves waiting so they could run the slave? Uh, right now. That's not something we're prepared to deal with, but let's talk. That's something we've talked to the DRBD people about right now. It's really more as much a DRBD issue as it is a Linux HA issue. Uh, he's asking about a backup slave nodes for DRBD, and uh, I don't know the answer to that question really. I haven't talked to DRBD people about it for a while. Uh, we've talked about various things, and I don't know what the current status is on that. There's another question up here up the aisle. Yes. That, that's actually something that's supported in release two. He asked about whether we monitor the app application, but that's supported in release two. Yes, you have a question here. How does your um, We support every configuration support. We support configurations they don't support. Ours uh, is an open community project, which a lot of people have involved in over a number of years. And there historically has not had CBS available outside, outside of the organization. We're, we're working with them, and they're looking seriously at release two stuff because they, like we, read kind of the end of their current architecture. And with regard to whether that will happen or not, you know, like they say about the operators, it's over until the fat lady sings. But right now, we have we're in some uh, uh, positive discussion with them, and uh, that all looks pretty good right now. But, you know, it's not for me to say, it's for them to say. Yes. Further question? I guess I should look towards the audience when I ask that question. Okay. I, 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 are there further questions? Are there yeah, okay. So, you know, so far back there, I need new glasses, I think. Go ahead, you, uh, with your hand, the right hand up right there. Uh, in case of a failover, you, uh, you take the IP address and the uh, new active node. 
Uh, what about the MAC address? Is it important to take the uh, The truth is that, that IPMS takeover is just a resource to us. We can take over any kind of resource for which someone has written a resource agent. If you write a MAC address resource agent, it will work for you. We don't currently supply one. We know people who have done that. But if you want to supply one, it can be, uh, we, one of my bylines is we are always looking for patches. Okay. <clears throat> Further questions? No, don't, you can't do that. Raise your if you raise your hand while putting your code on, you're asking a question. <laughs> Further question? Oh, over here, yes. Uh, the guy who asked a minute ago, right? Go ahead. Uh, do you have something uh, as a special techniques for long distance? Do we have special techniques for long distance clusters? In release one, we have absolutely nothing for that. In release two, we're think we've been thinking about it. Again, we want to get 2.0.0 out and stable, and then we're going to start looking at problems we haven't tried to address in the past. That is something we have had in the back of our minds when we're designing release 2. We have some good ideas for it, but it's not ready. <coughs> yes, uh, up there at the top. The do, you the short line here. do you have integration with re-imaging systems? So that if you start off with five machines doing handling one service, another five machines doing another service, and all five in this service break down, you need to rebuild two other machines to take over that service. Oh, uh, if you have a, if you can write a resource agent that does what you need to do, no, I'm sorry. I mean, the question is, it's a script. If you can write it, if you write an init script that does what you want it to do, then that init script will work yeah. just fine for us. Uh, you, you, you can, yeah, you can code a situation where, which says, oh dear, I have no nodes left in that that service. Um, you, that's, that's a possibility. Uh, it's not something people have asked about, honestly. Um, but, you know, the, the thing that happens as time goes on, people use it more and more, and they do more and more different things with it, you know? Um, I'd be interested to hear if you, if you want to do that. Uh, there are probably some difficult, there's a, like everything else, probably some difficulties that will come. But I can't think of any theoretical reason why you would, one wouldn't be able to. Yeah, yes, here on the uh, Release two, when? Uh, release 2.0.0 will be within the next month. I would imagine we'll have a fully stable... Remember, HA is about paranoia. You're not carrying out the paranoia, which you should be, right? Not that we're trying to produce crap. That's not it. It's about paranoia. It's about making sure that other people... You know, we're going to try and have the 2.0.0 out, I imagine, by... I would be happy to run on any system, even if, no matter how paranoid you are. But you have to get the 0.0, .0 release in order to get to that point. There's no way to get there without going through a .0 or a .0 release. Further questions, girls, you can go now. <laughs>